Okay, so Anuruddha says that's his conception of the ideal monk. Okay, now they turn to Venerable Mahakasava. You know, this kind of standard image of Mahakasava. How does Mahakasava usually look in the images of him? Stern, uh, not the bright, welcoming, pleasant, smiling face, but kind of figure that, you know, when you have to go before him, you feel like a, a little bit afraid of him. <laughs> because he could read into one's mind and he will know just about all one's thoughts. I used to know a monk like that in Sri Lanka. He was actually a German monk who was an observer of the ascetic practices, the Dutangas. And I used to call him the, the Mahakasapa of the present era. He since passed away in 2005, 2006. In his 90s, he passed away. But when he first became a monk, he lived for I think 11 years at the place called the Island Hermitage. This is an island in a lagoon in southwest Sri Lanka. And he almost never left the Island Hermitage, but always stayed there. And he was, at that time, he was very closely associated with Anwal Nyanamoli, the translator of the Sudhi Maka, who was alive. This would have been in the late 19th beginning from about 1953 on till 1964 he stayed at the island hermitage and then in 1964 he felt that he had enough of staying fixed in one place and so then he made the determination that throughout the year except during the four months of the rainy season he would always keep on traveling without any fixed abode. And so he did this. Each year, eight months, he would always travel. If he found a place that he liked, he would stay there for a few days, maybe even a few weeks. He never traveled by bus or by, by car, always traveling by foot. Um, he had walked the length and breadth of Sri Lanka quite a few times. This was before the war broke out. So he would travel from the north, Jaffa in the north, down to Matra in the south, from the west coast to the east coast. No fixed abode. And Sometimes he would have to come in to Colombo for medical treatment, especially during his later years. And then he would stay in one monastery in Colombo. And when we heard that he was there, we would go to him to get advice from him. But we were always a little bit afraid because he was, I don't know what the stern would be the word. He wasn't so much stern with others, but he was stern with himself. But it showed a little bit in his mannerism. And he seemed to have the ability, I don't know whether we can say that he actually read individual thoughts, but he knew very, very precisely what a person was going through at the time when they would go to speak to him. So he, his advice was always very precisely tuned to the needs of that person. Okay, so I think Mahakasabo was some of the this we could say is somebody a little bit like Mahakasapa. So Mahakasapa describes his conception of the ideal monk. And he mentions what are called in Pali the Dutangas. These are the aesthetic practices.
Sometimes they're called also Dutta Guna, we say the virtues, the ascetic virtues, or Duttanga means literally the ascetic fact, the factors of asceticism. The word Dutta literally comes from a word, a verb, which means to shake off. So observing these practices is supposed to be the means to shake off certain defilements like craving, <clears throat> laziness, discontent. Okay, so here a bhikkhu is a forest dweller himself. That is, he makes the determination always to live in the forest, not to live in a monastery, in a town, or a city, or even in a village. And he speaks in praise of forest dwelling to others. So you can see, even the ascetic monk is concerned not only with his own good by, observ by observing the ascetic practices, but also he tries to promote the good of others by encouraging the others in the ascetic practices. Okay, he is an alms food eater himself and speaks in praise of eating alms food. Actually, we use the word pindapata, comes to be used generally to describe all of the food that is given to a monk or a nun. We say that it's all pindapata, which means alms food. But in a way that's, maybe you could say it's a polite lie or <laughs> polite self-deception, since the real meaning of pindapata is food that one gets by going on alms round from house to house. And this is an institutionalized practice in some of the southern Buddhist countries like Thailand, Burma, maybe Laos, Cambodia. So every day people come out of their houses, they prepare a large quantity of food, they set up a little table outside their house with pots of food on it, and then the monks come walking by, and as they go by they'll scoop some rice into the alms bowl of the monk, and then take a little bags with some bianjana, some curry or some prepared dish and put it into the bowl or into a separate container. But the real old style pindapata is going without any people expecting one in advance so that one just turns up at the door, you know, unexpected, and then the people have to get whatever leftovers they have and heat it up and offer it to one. Or sometimes if they're expecting ascetics then they'll have something prepared, but they keep it in the house, they don't set up a little table outside because they know that a line of monks is going to go by. Okay, so one who accepts, one who undertakes this practice, makes the determination not to accept food, to accept invitations to the houses for a meal, not to accept food which lay people will bring to the temple or monastery to offer. So sometimes lay people will make an arrangement with the monastery to bring food on a certain day. So all of the regular monks, well, they don't go on alms round, but they just remain in the temple, knowing that on that day the lay people will prepare, will bring a meal, and usually they prepare very delicious, sumptuous food. But if the monk has made this resolution to eat only the alms food, he won't stay behind for the lay people to come, but he'll go out from house to house collecting the food. Okay, so this was another practice Mahakasapa observes and praises to others. Then he is what is called the refuse rag wearer and speaks in praise of wearing refuse rags. Okay, now 
the normal kind of robe that monks wear is a robe which is prepared in advance, like this robe, you know, some person had bought it in a shop. Like in the Buddhist countries, they have what are called monk shops, <laughs> which are shops that specialize. They have robes, arms bowls, <laughs> sets of what they call the eight requisites. Divine eyes. Can you buy divine eyes there? <laughs> divine eyes. <laughs> These, like, what do they call them? Straight edge razors. It's a little boring, you know, because there are <laughs> changing styles from us. And they have Buddhist, yeah, this is what they also have Buddha statues and little models of stupas in which they put sometimes relics and other precious items. can get an American company to go in there. You know, they'll change the style every season so that <laughs> really turn it into a profitable business. Okay, so those are like ready-made robes. And even in some of the monasteries, the monks will receive new pieces of cloth, white cloth, which they then cut up sew themselves, and then die and wear. But one who makes the resolve to use what are called the refuse rag robe, this person goes, usually they go to the, what's called the charnel ground, where they wrap up corpses. I hope you people don't get afraid. <laughs> they wrap up corpses in white cloth and discard them in the charnel ground. So then the monk who wants to make a robe will go to the charnel ground and cut off pieces of cloth from the corpses and then bring them back and sew them together, but wash them and then dye them in order to make a robe. Okay, and then he's the triple robe wearer, that is he uses only the three basic robes there's the under robe, which is like a skirt, the upper robe, which is this robe. Then there's something like, it's a double thick robe, basically the same shape as this, but usually we fold it in half and we use it a little bit like a shawl when it gets cool. But then one is entitled to use, you know, several of each robe, you know, one can take an old robe and then one uses it for when one is washing a new robe. But somebody who makes the determination to use only three robes won't have that extra, those extra robes. But if he's washing the robe, an upper robe, then he'll wear the double thick robe. And if he's washing the under robe, then he has actually a bathing cloth, which is the same shape. And he'll wear the bathing cloth while the under robe is being washed and dried. Okay, so this, these are the ascetic practices. And then Mahakasapa also speaks about certain more inward virtues, and these build up in a progressive order. He starts that the monk is one who has few wishes himself and speaks in praise of fumes of wishes. You know, not to have desire for excessive possessions. He is content himself and speaks in praise of contentment, secluded himself and speaks in praise of seclusion. He is aloof from society himself. This could be a little misleading. I think now aloof is not such a good choice of words. Of course, it suggests that the word aloof suggests some kind of cold condescension, but that's not what is intended here. It's rather that the monk is not one who likes to mix and socialize very much, but he prefers seclusion. 
and he's energetic himself and speaks in, proud, in praise of arousing energy. He is, observes the virtue or the precepts himself and speaks in praise of the observance of virtuous behavior. He attains to samadhi, concentration, and praises concentration. He attains wisdom and speaks in praise of wisdom. And he has attained to liberation himself and speaks in praise of liberation. And he has attained to the knowledge and vision of liberation and speaks in praise of the knowledge and vision of liberation. So this is the way Mahakasapa praises the ideal one. Maybe at this point I'll ask whether there are any questions. Okay, Richard. Okay, let's take Matt. You're closest. Well, the, uh, I had to develop the divine eye the other monks, there seems to be a process by which you can reach this kind of level of attainment, but the, the divine eye just seems to be something that you either possess or don't possess. Yeah, but that, that actually isn't the case. <clears throat> there is a, a process or a method sort of described in some texts for attaining it. Of course, it helps if one has a natural <laughs> aptitude for it. But the texts speak about first gaining the four jhanas, the four meditative absorptions. And then what one is supposed to do, the method is actually described in detail in the Visuddhimagga, based on the tradition of the ancient commentators. What one does is develop <coughs> the jhana, excuse me, <coughs> jhanas based on the perception of light. So it's focusing on a bright light and then gaining deep absorption into that light. And then based on that light, one extends that light over greater and greater distances. And as one does so, it illuminates those distant areas. And then one can extend that light in such a way through the appropriate determination that it will illuminate other realms of existence that are ordinarily invisible to us. Out of your own causes and conditions and resting at that and then 
I mean, this question takes us a little bit away from it. It does, I know. But we can go um, another time. It's just... I think when to get what's called the right, at least from the Buddhist point of view, the right view, one has to have, well, I would say the understanding of the principles of the Dhamma, both yes. through learning and through insight. Just to put it very simply in a nutshell. Okay, I'll just take one question, then I want to finish the sutta, go back and finish the sutta. I have, I have two simple questions about the second paragraph on five, when Ravata is speaking. Yeah. Um, he says, a bhikkhu to lights in solitary meditation and yeah. takes delight in solitary meditation. Yeah. Are those supposed to mean two different things or is that a repetition? It's just the way the Pali language is used. They're really the same thing, but one uses one grammatical form, the other a slightly different grammatical form. But the words are the same. Okay, and second, what is the point of dwelling in empty huts? Are those huts that have been deserted? As you mean, huts that people have built and then they've moved to some larger no. or newer place? No, no, these are the huts that are built in the forest, especially for the monks to use for meditation. Oh. So, okay, so just being a forest monk. Yeah, but we can take this in a very broad sense to also include in a bigger building, it would be like a quiet room. So any place which is quiet, where one has privacy, where one is able to undertake a practice of meditation without being interrupted and disturbed, in a broad sense that could count as an empty, it's, called, it's actually sunyagara, it literally means an empty house rather than hut. But usually, when a belt or huts. Okay, so those are the two questions. Then. So let us go now to the next question, the next um, one to speak. So now Sariputta turns to Mogalana and says that each has spoken, now it's your turn. And so Mogalana describes his ideal monk. He says, two bhikkhus engage in a talk on, the Pali uses the expression here, Abhidhamma. And I think this is a mistaken translation. Higher Dhamma is as they're talking about a body of knowledge called the Abhidhamma. This has to go, I've come to a better understanding of how this word is used in the canonical text. <laughs> okay, in the canonical text, let me just write it, Abhi. and then a certain body of a very technical knowledge with a fine analysis of mental states and factors of existence. 
The word Abhidhamma occurs in the suttas, but I don't think it has that special meaning or that it means a kind of special Dhamma or a higher Dhamma. But rather, what I've noticed, I mean, others have noticed this too, is that the word Abhidhamma is always used in relation to disciples who are speaking about the Dhamma, not something that the Buddha teaches. And so it seems to be used to mean that the word Abhi simply has what we would call a reflexive meaning. That is, it means something like about. So they're engaged in a talk about the Dhamma. It's not a talk on some higher Dhamma, but Abhi has a reflexive meaning. It just bends back upon the word Dhamma. So they're having a talk about the Dhamma and they question each other and when each one is questioned they're able to answer fluently without hesitation and so their talk rolls on in accordance with the Dhamma. So this is Moggallana's answer and what's a little bit interesting here is that Moggallana's answer doesn't reflect his own specialization. What is Moggallana's specialization? Great spiritual power. Yeah, great spiritual power, or what we would call psychic powers. Some call them mystical powers or magical powers. You know, it, yeah, the Pali word is iddhi. Yes, like the ability to fly through the air, go through the earth. Yeah, fly through the air, air, go through the sink into the earth, walk across water, um, send out multiple copies of oneself to be several places at the same time, walk through the walls. But maybe that would have been you know, setting the standards, maybe setting up too rarefied a model for the accomplishment of a monk. So Moggallana answers instead in terms of being able to conduct a discussion on the Dhamma. Okay, so then finally they turn to Sariputta, who has been the one who up to this point has been asking the others to state their ideals. And so they ask Sariputta to explain his ideal. And Sariputta says, on page 310 here, a monk, a monk feels mastery over his mind. He does not let the mind wield mastery over him. In the morning, he abides in whatever abiding or attainment he wants to abide in during the morning, saying that the midday, some of the evening. And what's meant here by abiding or attainment means a particular meditative state. So if this monk wants to dwell in any of the four jhanas, he can dwell in that particular jhana. If he wants to dwell in any of the formless attainments, he can dwell in that particular formless attainment. If he wants to dwell in the attainment of cessation, he can enter cessation. So he has complete mastery over all of these meditative attainments. And then Sariputta compares this to a king or a king's minister or a wealthy woman on Fifth Avenue, Manhattan, who has a chest full of variously colored garments. In the morning he could put on whatever pair of garments he wants in the morning, same at, the mid at midday, same in the evening. And so, in the same way, this monk can enter any time of day into any attainment he wants to. Okay, so at this point, they've all expressed their own ideas. And so then Sariputta says to the group of fellow monks, he says, we've all spoken according to our own ideals. Let us go to the Buddha and question him about this matter and hear what the Buddha has to say. 
And so they go to the Buddha, they report the whole conversation to him, and the text very faithfully repeats the answer of each monk, which is abridged here. And then finally, and after each one the Buddha approves and says, good, good. Each one is speaking according to, is speaking in a way that's natural to him, since each of these disciples has this particular ability or specialization. So he gets, goes through Sariputta on page 312, paragraph 16. Then paragraph 17, Sariputta asks the Buddha, which of us has spoken well? Then the Buddha says, you have all spoken well, Sariputta, each in his own way. But now let me tell you the kind of monk that could adorn this solid tree forest. Here, the monk has returned from his alms round, and after his meal, he sits down, he folds his legs crosswise, sets his body erect, establishes mindfulness before him, and resolves, I shall not break this sitting position until my mind is liberated from the asanas, from the taints, through non-clinging. That is the kind of monk that could illuminate the solitary forest. So the Buddha here is pointing to a monk who's not yet an arhat, but who sits there and makes that determination that in this very seat I will reach the final goal. So maybe we should all go out now. We could skip lunch today. The weather is quite pleasant outside. To find a little place under the shade, sit down, cross our legs, and make the determination. <laughs> None of us will rise up until our mind is liberated from the taints through non clinging <laughs> But maybe we'll put it off till next week. <laughs> short questions, quick questions, save the longer ones for after lunch. In, in this last thing where the Buddha says this, it's, it's almost a sense that it's immediate. That it's? Immediate. That you might make a determination to sit, but just the resolve itself brings the nirvana. Immediately. That there is no need to go through the jhanas, there's no need to develop anything. Freedom is right here. No, not quite. I mean, the monk, well, he makes that resolve, but he would sit there, he would probably enter into the jhanas, unless he's a practitioner of the dry insight meditation. But he has to make a very diligent effort. In fact, in some text, that kind of resolution is expressed willingly let as it go, the blood and flesh dry up on my body <laughs> and let only the skin, bones and sinews remain, but I will not budge from the seat until my mind is liberated from the taints through not clinging. But I think we have to be a little careful how we interpret this, because this is, I would say that this is intended for a monk or a practitioner who has already accumulated all of what we would call the supporting conditions. So probably this, a monk who makes this determination would already have mastered at least a few of the jhanas and have already reached high levels of insight of insight knowledges. And so the monk recognizes that he's very close to the breakthrough. And sort of to push him over the precipice, he has to make that determination not to move until he's liberated. 
I used to do that when I was in Sri Lanka, but then you know, after a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, the pain, it's just too much. Yeah, tomorrow I'll make, <laughs> I'll make that resolution. But now, <laughs> let me readjust my life. <laughs> oh, these mosquitoes are terrible. <laughs> let me get up and move inside instead of sitting out here. <laughs> let me go up and spray on some anti-mosquito propellant. <laughs> Okay, let us end for the morning. So we end with the sharing of the merits. Thank you.